really wonderful. And, um, you know, what, what we talked about was how difficult it is for people to understand what pluralism in, is when we st first started talking about this. There's, uh, there's a lot of mushy talk about it. Yes. And um, people getting excited, people getting frightened. And what we hoped you would do was to deconstruct it and give it a shape. <laughs> because you're one of the few people who actually thinks about it all over the world all the time. And I thought that you did an enormous favor to Canada by laying it out in a way that no Canadian has, quite frankly. We may be the center of a lot of this, but we've never had the courage or the calm to lay it out the way you have. So I personally am very grateful to you, and uh, you. I think, the, as you saw, the audience is Thank too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Did you find it, uh, no, this is really very silly with Adrian sitting over the me there and me asking questions, but anyway, it's, uh, I'll do my best. <laughs> I mean, did you, when you started working on this, you, I guess you started to think your way through all the experiences you've had around the world and to see how they fit together and whether it could be deconstructed. Well, I think what, what happens is that you observe, you uh, respond to difficulties in various parts of the world, you ask what have been the causes of, the, of those difficulties. And you ask yourself how many of those difficulties were predictable. And uh, if they're predictable, what are the instruments you need to understand the predictability and perhaps to preempt some of the, the problems. And that's really been a significant part of my life because of the work that I do in Asia and Africa. I mean, one of the things that really struck me in what you said was that in spite of this astonishing, all this communication, all these methods mm -hmm. of communication, the levels of ignorance about each other are almost higher than they used to be. I think that's true, and, and uh, I think it's one of the major sources of the conflicts we're seeing around the world, which is that there is very great uh, ignorance in terms of general knowledge. Um, I think general knowledge has been seen in many parts of the world as uh, an attribute of tertiary education. In the developing world, it has to be an attribute of secondary education. And the reason is that there is such a small percentage of children that go into tertiary education that it is at the level of secondary education that the most important areas of knowledge have to be given to young boys and young women. What do you think has to be done? I mean, it's, I don't think it's any better here, quite frankly, but I mean, what do you think has to be done? Well, I think we need to, to first of all, identify what is useful for children in various parts of the world in their societies. I'm not certain that the curricula for rural children in the third world should be necessarily the same curricula as children in the urban environments because uh, there is commonality, but there's no e equal, uh, equal use. So I think that uh, what needs to be done is to define what is useful for the young girl or the young boy's uh, future and uh, try to widen their horizons and give them knowledge which they can use during their lifetime. And today, knowledge of pluralism is, I think, one of the most important things, and that will, if it's going to happen, will happen through education. I mean, one of the things that uh, I don't think anyone here is going to disagree with this, that's, and, and um, it's happening, I think, throughout the West, is that our societies are changing. We're in a city with basically half the population wasn't born here, mm. and yet we're still teaching in our universities and therefore in our schools the European canon, as if everything came from about ten thinkers right. in two or three countries. And, right. uh, <laughs> and certainly none of them are Islamic or Buddhist or, uh, you know, from Africa. Well, uh, many, many years ago, more than half a century, I sat through a course called Humanities One uh, <laughs> at Harvard. And I, rec I can recollect to my amazement at the narrowness of what we were taught in that subject, in that course, in relation to what I certainly felt I, I needed to know. And uh, I think that's one of the problems, is that general education has remained very, very narrow in most parts of the world. 
how do you, how do you change that? I mean, it, it, I guess the tenure system, the narrow system, it just keeps feeding off itself, and in a way, it's getting narrower, not broader. Right. Well, I'm, I think one of the problems that, that I have certainly seen is the lack of pedagogical material in these other subjects, which are necessary, because these societies have not developed their own pedagogical material for their own purposes, let alone for global purposes. And uh, so you, it's easy to criticize humanities one at Harvard, but you ask yourself, well, what is the alternative for the professors who are teaching that course? And the alternative is to go and use material that young students will find useful. That material itself is extremely difficult to find. We are talking about civilizations, areas of the world, which have not produced that material even for themselves. I suppose what you see now in Western universities, and so it's not even in the, in the secondary schools, is that when there is a breakout, say, to learning about Islam, it's some sort of specialist course on the side that's optional. That doesn't touch the core. No, because you end up by educating a very small number of people who are specialists in the subject. But in a democracy, you ask everybody to express an opinion. Yes. <laughs> what an original idea. <laughs> I wonder why Unless didn't... I've misunderstood what democracy is about. <laughs> but... No, you notice the silence. It's, um, it's, uh, it's surprising how it isn't understood that easily. Uh, I, I noticed that you talked about this uh, graduate school, basically journalism graduate school mm -hmm. at your university in, Pax in Pakistan and in East in Africa. South. Uh, one of the difficulties with uh, journalism schools in the West is that they tend to teach technical stuff and, mm. and not the content of what it is mm. to be a journalist. Right. What is going to happen in those schools? How is it going to help? Well, I think the, the basic question is how do you develop quality communication in the developing world? And uh, one of the things that we've looked at is who has the ultimate responsibility for what is sold on the, new, on the uh, streets, what is shown on television. And I think our conclusion has been essentially that it is the owner rather than the manufacturer of the product. And therefore what we're looking at in our school of journalism is going to be to educate owners about what are their responsibilities to society, what are their responsibilities to the region, because ultimately they have to decide what it is that they want to uh, distribute within their own countries. Now, there are other areas also. We are finding it very difficult in many countries to find, for example, journalists who have been educated in comparative government. And so when you have a referendum on a constitution and you want to illustrate to your readership what are the difference of forms of government that people are being asked to, to comment on, finding the competent journalists to write on comparative government in the developing world is a very, very big problem. Which means that when there's a referendum on a constitution, the actual value of that referendum becomes subject to question. I was just, as you were talking about um, educating the owners, I was just staring out there at a handful of senior journalists wondering what they were thinking about their owners being educated. Um, <laughs> it's a very fascinating concept, actually. I mean, has it actually started or you're about to start it? No, we're about to start and uh, we've had a lot of help from a no number of in important institutions. But I think that, uh, you know, owners have different goals. Some run uh, their operations just as a business enterprise. They don't really mind what they do to society. Others are very, very committed to political goals uh, or to political parties or to faith communities. And what is really important is to try to offer to people in the developing world competent analysis. And it's the, the problem of finding competence which is so difficult for us. 
Would you accept uh, owners of Canadian media to come and be educated? I mean, no, I'm not being critical at all. I just was thinking about it as I was sitting here. <laughs> You're open to all. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll uh, give you a little secret. The Globe and Mail was a partner of ours in launching our East African newspapers. That's interesting. Very interesting. And uh, they helped us put together what is today the largest media group in Eastern Africa. I don't think many Canadians know that. No. <laughs> Has the Globe and Mail told us? I don't know. I'm staring out there at some people. <laughs> Maybe that would be an interesting story to be told more in this country. <laughs> Perhaps it has and I was away, I don't know. Um, and it was fascinating the way you talked about, and I, I forget the exact quote, quote but that, that uh, basically that I don't believe in some natural uh, disposition to welcome the stranger, that in, in, in essence pluralism isn't natural. Mm -hmm. It has to be learned, it has to be taught. Right. I think it'd be interesting to talk a bit more about that, because people are We've never really engaged with that. I, we, we've always wanted to think in Canada that whatever this was we were doing, that it was natural. Mm. Well, um, <laughs> and I don't think it works, but it, there's no proof that it's natural. Well, I sense a pluralism of opinion on that in the audience, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I think that it, it, it is not something which is natural to the individual. Individuals are born into society, into social constructs, into faith constructs, and the importance is to educate them to look uh, wider afield. And I think it can start very, very early. Uh, you, uh, in Canada, have some remarkable when uh, men and women in early childhood development, for example. And they have indicated that uh, it's from the age of birth practically till the age of three or four that the child is most malleable to accepting other people uh, around. So that, if it's true, and I believe it is true, means that in countries of the developing world, we have to reverse our thinking on education. It means we have to make massive investment in early childhood development. We have to tra take those initiatives out into the countryside. We have to harness many, many more women than have ever been thought of in the past. So that from the earliest age, difference is seen as normal, not abnormal. If you were sort of... I mean, you, you're a Canadian. Uh, you've uh, you told the best hockey joke I've heard in years. <laughs> By far, I must say. <laughs> there are a lot of bad hockey jokes, so it's uh, very courageous to tell, and it was wonderful. Um, uh, what, when, you, when you look at Canada, I mean, yes, we've done some work in this area of education for young people. Do you have any thoughts about what we could be doing more of? Well, we uh, have done quite a lot of work in this field, and what we've tried to do is to render difference normal in all our educational material. And simple things. People who are of different racial backgrounds in little drawings for small children, wearing different clothes, looking at different objects, so that the notion of uh, variegated societies is a common accepted feature of education. Later on, you can expand that into humanities one, and you can add a whole lot of subjects there. But I think that that issue starts much earlier with the development of the human being. Interestingly enough, Adrian and I were at a place called Rose Avenue Public School, which you would love, uh, in a, a very heavily new Canadian area of mm -hmm. Toronto. And they have possibly, or had at least, the most interesting philo philosophy course I've ever seen which was basically a, a, a basic philosophical ideas from all the religions, right. showing how they fit together, right. and then just giving it to these seven and eight-year-olds and allowing them to use it to talk about their families and right. the environment and, 
and yeah. whatever. And it was right. a, an explosion of ideas of, from kids who had just arrived yes. from somewhere else. Yes. Well, I, I uh, tried to refer to that by using this expression, uh, a cosmopolitan ethic. And I think the notion of a cosmopolitan ethic is something which all people can buy into, can identify with, because it's an ethic for people. And that ethic for people, or let's say the essential components of the ethics for people, I have seen in most faiths that I know. And I suppose the ignorance that we're talking about of not knowing about the other faiths makes people think that it doesn't exist in the other faiths. Uh, or imagine that it doesn't exist. I wouldn't be able to comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating thing because that, most people, when they hear the word cosmopolitan, they think of something that isn't about citizenship. I think it's a very interesting and an innovative way of using the word cosmopolitan. Mm -hmm putting it with ethics and saying yes. that this is a new form of sophistication, in effect. Well, that, that's why I tried to identify it as an ethic for all people. Cosmopolitan means for all people. But the word doesn't re isn't used that way today, but that's what it means. I've often said that Toronto is the most cosmopolitan city in the world because it has the biggest mixture of races and languages right. and cultures in the world, and people right. stare at you thinking, does that make us cosmopolitan? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> the answer is yes, yeah, according to your definition, yes. I would, and I would yes. agree with it. Yes. Yeah. How do you think we push to get people to understand it? We keep explaining it, obviously, but what do we need to do? Well, I think, uh, as I said, it, it is not only in education. I would say it's also in, at least in our parts of the world, in civil society. I think that what I have observed in the last, say, 50 years is that where you have government instability or where you have government incompetence, the only real resource that will replace government or government incapacity is civil society. That is, the institutions of men and women who have a purpose and who can manage and produce results from that purpose. And that, I can give you the example of Bangladesh, I can give you the example of Kenya. Uh, think around the developing world and you will see that there are so many countries that have had unstable government in the past 50 years. Those that have moved forwards well, practically all of them have seen development as a result of strong civil society. So I think that civil society also has to be pluralist. And that means getting the intelligentsia from all communities and not leaving certain communities aside. You're looking for competence and merit from all communities to work in civil society. So that then turns on a very effective public education system. You need a public education system, but it can be continuing education. It doesn't have to be academic. It can also be non-academic. Mm -hmm. on, a, on a sort of more negative note, um, if we look at Europe, for example, today, we can see a return of fear of populism, yes. the kind of 19th century uh, nationalism, the sense that gosh, our culture is in danger, and by culture they mean yeah. that old idea of culture. Yes. What do you, how, how bad is that? What you've been observing it, you've been moving around, what do you think can be done about that? Well, my, my sense is there, there are a number of forces at play. Clearly the, the recession is hurting. And when there's a recession, attitudes to immigration become more aggressive. So I think we have a problem to, uh, there in terms of uh, the recession in Europe, which has been pretty severe, frankly. I think we've seen unplanned immigration, and uh, that has caused a lot of tension, particularly in the Mediterranean countries, because they are the ones that are receiving most of this pressure. So I think there's that. I think there's the fact that there are immigrant communities like here in Canada, which are bringing with them their inherited attitudes 
of conflict with others, for example, which creates a problem when they come into Canada or France or anywhere else. So there are a number of troubling signs there which need to be managed. I happen to believe it's only a passing phase. Mm. But I think that the European countries are going to have to take necessary measures to work themselves out of this phase. And I have to say that I mentioned it in my comments earlier. If there's a serious analysis of these situations, I believe you can preempt many of them. You don't have to let them build up to becoming difficult. I'm absolutely convinced that many of the situations we have seen and worked in, we knew that forces were building up to a situation where there was going to be a problem. And the difficulty is to identify what the trigger is. The difficulty is to identify what parts of the problem you preempt. But no, very often it's a composite of forces that come to play, like in Kyrgyzstan or in Kenya or elsewhere. Some of them are pre-conflict, some of them are post-conflict. So this is the whole role of the Global Center for Pluralism, is to go and understand around our globe where those forces are at play and to see whether they are capable of being anticipated, maybe unraveled before they become problematic. That's a very exciting idea, actually, I think. I, I loved your phrase, pluralism is not a cause for anxiety, but a source of delight. <laughs> it's, well, it's a wonderful idea. Thank you. thank you. Well, I think you show it in Canada. Well, that's, thank you. that's why the center's in Canada. <laughs>